Logi, and welcome to another edition of Logi Power-Ups. Today's power-up will be based on a pretty simple dominant seventh and chromatic figure, but the main difference comes in how we're going to play this figure. This power-up is going to be the first power-up in a subcategory that I have called improv, meaning we're going to improvise with how we play this figure by using a variety of different fingerings that take us around the fretboard. This means when we play over the final video, there is almost no chance that you and I will be playing the same thing because I'm gonna be improvising with how I'm doing it and you're going to be improvising with how you're gonna do it. Now the notes are not gonna be different. The notes will always be the same. It's simply where and how we're playing them. So I could be in first position playing the figure while you're in the last position playing the same figure. The notes, again, are not different. It's just where and how we're playing them. This power-up will be split into parts one, two, three, where we'll learn the variety of different ways to play the figure. And then again, over the final video where we will improvise with how we play everything. If you enjoyed this type of instructional material, feel free to check out my Patreon at the link below. And now let's get on to part one. All right, before we start going over exactly what it is that we're going to play, let me go over the whole concept of what's happening here. We're going to learn this figure that's about a bar long, and we're going to move through the circle of force or circle of fists, however you want to call it. So we would start on A, then we move to D, then G, C, F, B flat, E flat, A flat, D flat, F sharp, B, E, and then finally back to A. The way that we're going to play this will allow us to continuously move through that cycle non stop. So this entire thing, we are not going to stop ever. We're going to seamlessly connect into each chord. And how we're going to do that is by learning three different ways to play this exact phrase. And each way is going to move us a different way on the fretboard. So for example, the fingering that we're going to learn today will take us vertically down the fretboard like this. So we will be pretty much staying in one position, but we will be moving down the strings. The next fingering that we'll learn in the next video will take us down horizontally the fretboard. So we will be gradually moving this way. And then the final fingering will take us up horizontally the fretboard like this. So if we're starting here, we will be gradually moving up like that. You can mix and match which combinations you want to take you wherever you want. So if you're playing the fingering that we're going to go over today and you find yourself about to run out of room, you can make the decision to move back this way or up this way, or maybe up this way a little bit, up this way a little bit, and then back this way. You can kind of do whatever you want. And that's really where the improvising element comes into play. You're going to have to play this fingering and really your hands are going to have to play the part and your brain is going to need to pick where you want to move next. And you have to do that way in advance so you can set your, your fingering up to get into that new position to continue in whatever direction that you're planning on. So with that in mind, let's go over this first fingering of the actual figure. All right, let's go over what the first fingering is for this part, and it starts like this. Like I mentioned earlier, it's kind of dominant seventh with a little bit of chromaticism. So the first run is an arpeggio that's stacking thirds until we get from one to four, or one to 11, if you want to call it that. That would look like this. One, three, five, flat seven, two, and then four. Or if you want to think about it as one, three, five, flat seven, nine, 11, if that makes more sense to you, because all we're really doing is just stacking thirds. Right, we play a note, go up a third, 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 and as long as we stay in the key, that's what it would naturally be when you do this off of a dominant seventh sound. And you can see my fingering, it's pretty simple. It's middle finger, pointer, pinky, middle, pointer, pinky. It's actually really easy. I didn't even realize that until right now. It's just the same fingering two times in a row. Right? It's kind of like you're playing an A major arpeggio and then G major arpeggio when you get to the top. Pretty simple. So my right hand, again, the technique or how we are physically playing this isn't really the big deal with this particular thing. The improv element is really the focus here. But if you want to know what I'm doing picking wise, pretty simple. I'm kind of doing like downstroke, upstroke, hammer on, downstroke, upstroke, hammer on, I think. Something like that. I might throw in my middle finger here. Whatever. Do whatever makes sense to you. But that's the first part right there. And once we get the four right here, we're coming back to the two, chromatic up to the three. So that's the four back to the two, chromatic up to the third right there. Once we hit the third, we're walking back to the one. Pretty simple, just like that, three, two, one. Then chromatic down to the flat seven. So one, chromatic down to the flat seven. So one normal seven, flat seven. Let me play everything up to there. One, three, five, flat seven, two, four, two, walk up to three. You're on three, three, two, one, walk back to 
flat seven right there. After we hit the flat seven, we go down to the five, and then we do what I call trapping the four. So we're targeting this note, the four, but we're going to trap it by playing the notes ahead of it, behind it, and then the actual four. So five, play the note ahead of the four, behind the four, and then the four. You'll probably hear this around the music community called uh, chromatic enclosure, which if you want to call it that, that's fine. I call it trapping the four. I think it's just easier to remember. So let me play that whole entire phrase. You can see what it looks like. So I'll walk through it one more time. Um, walk through it one more time. So that's just the arpeggio straight up. One, three, five, flat seven, two, and then four. Go back to the two, chromatic up to three. Walk back three, two, one. Chromatic down to flat seven. Then we play the five and then trap the four. I think I'm doing it with my pinky right there too. So five, trap the four by playing the note ahead of it, behind it, and then hit the four right there. So even though this is the four of our starting chord, right? Our starting chord is A. That's kind of where I'm starting it right there. That's the root. That's the four. Yes, that's true. But in reality, it's really the root of the next chord. Because by the time we hit this D, we are now on to the next chord, which is a fourth up from where we started, like I mentioned. So it's going to run like this. We're going to play this figure. When we get there, we're going to do the exact same figure, except now we're doing it on D. So the figure is identical. One, three, five, flat seven, two, four, two, chromatic up to three. Everything's exactly the same. Same exact thing. The only difference, of course, is the fingering is slightly different because of the tuning issue of the guitar. It's really when you hit that B string or high E string, everything you're doing on those two strings has to be shifted up a fret from where you would naturally do it on these four strings right here, which is why when we get to the top string, right, this is a four string phrase, right? We're going through four strings. Notice where those last two notes are of this position, but notice where they are when I start on the A string. They're not there, that would be incorrect. They have to be moved up a fret. That's something I call crossing the border, which is something I talk more about in my Patreon, if you're curious. So that's the main thing you have to learn. You have to learn what does this figure look like starting on the E string. Then you're here, what's this figure look like starting on the A string? And again, the only difference is that B string has to be shifted up a fret. All of this is exactly the same, but you don't go here, you go here, which is why I'm sh slightly shifting my fingering at the end pointer finger and then barring when I'm going from that flat seven to two, that's what I'm doing. You don't have to do that. You can play like middle finger pointer. I experimented with that a little bit. It's kind of cool, but I, I personally like just rolling the pointer, right? And then again, walking back, what are we doing? Trapping D's fourth, which is not really D's fourth. It's really the root of the next chord. Now we're onto the G, just continuing the circle of force. And we play the same figure here. Again, it's going to look different because we are dealing with that tuning issue. The 135 is going to look uh, exactly the same. But that's not where we're going, right? Because that would be flat seven any everywhere else. But now on the D string, when we start on the D string, it's not. It's here. It has to be shifted up a fret because of the tuning issue. So that's what it looks like right there. So I'll play that a little slower. One, three, five, flat seven, two. It's like a little nice, kind of little almost minor triad you see right there. One, three, five, flat seven, two, up to four, two, chromatic up to three, then two, one, chromatic down to the flat seven. Play the five, then trap the four which isn't really the four, that's actually the root of the next chord, etc. So once we get there, right, I just moved from A, D, G. Now what do we do when we get here? That's C, the next chord that we would naturally play. Well, we can't really do what we have just been doing because all the figures that we've just played are the same thing except for the slight tuning issues, but they're all four string uh, phrases, four string ideas. I'm on the G string right here. I can't continue because I run out of strings. One, three, five, flat seven, and then I don't have another string to play two and four. Now, of course, I can kind of jump up here and continue, but that kind of defeats the purpose of this exercise. So this is what we would do when we hit this note. That is when one of the other fingerings would come into play, a way that we can maybe move this way or move that way so we don't run out of room as we continue down, because we will eventually run out of strings to play. So for this first fingering, those are the three ways that we're going to play it. We're going to play it based off the A string, or excuse me, E string, 
the A string, and then the D string. And then once we get to the G string, we'll use other fingerings to play based off of that string that we'll cover in the next uh, sets of videos. So let me recap all of that stuff. It looks like this. Remember, the phrase is up an arpeggio from one all the way up to 11 or four, if you want to think about it like that. One, three, five, flat seven, two, up to the 11 or the four, back to the two. Chromatic up to three, walk down to one, there's one. Chromatic down to normal seven, or excuse me, flat seven. Then five, trap the four, which is really the root of the next chord, and then you do the whole thing over and over again. So the only thing you have to really practice or learn, uh, besides the actual part, is those differences once you start moving to different strings because of the tuning issue of the guitar forces you to, to adjust your fingering so that you're always playing the same notes. So you'll have to take some time to figure out exactly, exactly what they are. But once you get it down, I think it flows uh, fairly well. Well, use whatever, you know, musicality you want to use, hammer-ons, pull-offs, you know, whatever you want to do. If you want to um, alternate pick everything, that's fine. If you want to use picking fingers, it, that's kind of up to you. I'll leave that up to you to decide what's most comfortable. But the main thing here is just getting that fingering down and being able to seamlessly play it without thinking as you move through the strings. So that's pretty much it. What we're going to do here um, over this backing track that we're about to play over is we're going to run it like this. We're going to do each configuration twice. So we'll run it on the E string twice. That'll sound like this. Again. Then once we're done with that, we do it twice on the next string, the D string. Again, D string. Or Sorry, not D string. Uh, I'm playing D on the A string. Sorry about that. And then once we get here, we'll do it again twice on the actual D string. Again. Again, this is just to hammer the shapes into your hands so you don't have to think about them, right? You're just hammering them into your hands so they get mindless and you can start to think about other things. Once we do that, play each one twice, then we'll string all three of them together nonstop. That will sound like this. Next. Next. And then we stop, and then we do all of that over again. And I think we'll probably do it like three times total or something like that. So once you have these shapes ready, if you're able to play them comfortably without thinking about them, you have them memorized, come back to this part of the video, and we're going to run over this backing track that moves from 70 to 110. <clears throat> that does it for part one of this chromatic improv power-up. If you enjoy this type of instructional material, feel free to check out my Patreon at the link below, and I'll see you all in part two.